Last week, my wife Jane and I were on vacation down in Florida at the beautiful Wyndham Ocean Walk Daytona Beach Hotel, and it was beautiful. And we, we did one of those things where, uh, you've been to those things before where uh, you go hear a timeshare, a vacation share type uh, presentation, and you get 100 bucks. So I thought, hey, it's a rainy day. We looked ahead. It was Tuesday. It was going to be rainy. It's pouring rain. So we go to this presentation, and I'm thinking, you know, this is gas money from my Prius down to Florida and back. So it's a beautiful thing. And so uh, we go there, and we've been to many of these things before. And the guy, the guy was good. He said, one-third of you are going to buy it. And two-thirds of you are not going to buy it. And I was like, well, we're in the two-thirds side of things. And he goes on to give this compelling argument of how it is good for your soul to rest and to have vacation. And he talked about all the benefits of it. And um, he did it. He did a very good job. Now, for those of you that are new... um, I always brag on my wife because my wife is the greatest. Uh, And I don't say that because I'm in trouble and I got to say this, but it's true. She, if you read Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, that's what my wife is. She is, she has made me better for almost 29 years. I would not be in ministry if it was not for her. And it's, that is the truth. She's the lady, I'm the tramp. And and God has, um, as, as, she serves. She serves in the church. She serves at Macomb Christian. She is serving all the time. She makes our house a home, and, and she really does. Um, and for her, the best vacation is not having to serve. It's, it's being able just to relax and, and to kind of be served. Um, so we hear this whole presentation, and um, next thing you know, the guy gets done, and, and Jane looks at me and says, you know, I said, well, what do you think? And she says, let's do it. And I got my, uh, I kind of give my head, my head. Now, you understand, my wife does the finances in the house. Um, and I said, are you sure about this? Because we've been to this puppy, you know, a great many times and have walked away. And, uh, and, and she's like, no. She said, she's looking down the road. You know, Josh and Susan are getting married. And down the road, grandkids, we'd have a place to go vacation. And, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm sitting here saying, listen. Um, if anyone deserves it, she does. And so, like, you, you do the finances. If you think we can make this happen, I said, okay. If you're, next thing you know, whew, I'm signing away my life. You know, it's kind of like buying a house. Um, and so we, we get done with that, and I said, you're, you're good? She said, yeah, I'm good. And so it's still raining. We go to a movie. We, we go home that night, and uh, she's kind of doing a little research. And we go to bed, and I sleep like a baby all night long. No stirring. Why? I, I made my wife happy. You know, happy wife, happy life. Everything, everything is good. She, on the other hand, does not sleep from 2.30 till 6 in the morning. And when she wakes up, she grabs me and says, we have to cancel. And, and down in Florida, you have 10 days to cancel. And so we went in the morning uh, and said, uh, and we changed our mind. And they were excellent. Okay, no problem. Signed it, boom. And, and we, we were gone. What made the difference? You know, I, I had a, a timeshare, vacation points for 18 hours, right? I was, you know, I was going to have that. But what happened? What happened in those 18 hours? In those 18 hours, my wife counted the cost. She sat down, did a little research, started to look at it. And for us, at this time in our lives, I know many of you own those things. That's great. Um, but for us, at this time in our lives, she said, this is, this is not the right move for us right now. And I said, okay. See, see the difference is you you need to count the cost in life. This morning, we are going to see a man who counted the cost to be a Christ follower. And he comes out of the shadows and he boldly will make a stand for Jesus Christ. And it changed everything. Now, I say this because At the end of this service, I'm going to call for you to make a stand. Uh, What what I do pray for you guys all the time, and one of the things I think about is how many of us, how many of us are going through life and and we look Christian good, if you know what I mean. I mean we're we we're we're going through the Christian motions. We we got everything, but but in reality we are not making a clear 
stand for Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, there, there's several reasons why I'm, I'm going to implore you to do this, to really make a commitment, to make a stand, to count the costs to follow Jesus. Because part of it is the reality is there, there's people who can be lulled to sleep and think they're going to heaven and won't be. And so you, you need a bit of a wake-up call here on that one. And then there's some who just waste in their lives getting wrapped around the axle on millions of different things and, and not making a cost, not standing up for Jesus. And, and, the, and one of the greatest things is you have no joy in your life when you're living one world for you and, and one, one leg for Jesus. You're not. You, you will not have the joy that God made you to have. And so I'm going to plead with you at the end of this service that you would contemplate what Christ has done for you. And you would surrender all your thoughts, your feeling, your emotions, you would surrender all to him. Now, over the last several weeks, we have been in Luke. We have been going towards this time. We have spent time talking about how Jesus went to the cross. He took our condemnation. He took our, cro- our, our curse. He took our shame. He, he loves you and died for everything you've ever done wrong, ever. And if you will, by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, surrender your life to him. Not to say the words, but to give him your life. Make him your Lord, your Savior, your Master. He will forgive you your sins. He will remove them as far as the east is from the west. He will give you life. He will give you joy. And, and we have been, we've been talking about that. And, and that is great. But there, there's some of you that have been hearing that, have been new to the church, and you're like, hey, that's great. But I want even you and that decision to follow Jesus. I want you to count the cost. I, I, I don't want to be like that salesman that makes it sound so good that you sign on the dotted line. But you've got to understand, when you follow Jesus, it is a surrendering to him. It is a giving your life to him. It, and his ways are always best. Now, Last week, Pastor Jason talked about how Jesus died on the cross. He took his last breath. He, he said his last words, and, and he died. Now, what happens after that? Well, we read in John chapter 19, verse 31, since it was the day of preparation that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was, was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they may be taken away. You see, the, the religious leaders were very, they were very careful to make sure that this rule was being fulfilled, and yet when Jesus was on trial, they broke all kinds of, of, of their laws. Historians tell us that they would basically bring a, a sledgehammer-type mallet, and they would go up to the cross, and they would break the legs. Why would they do that? Well, they would do that because but because the way that they would breathe is they would push themselves up with their legs so they could gasp for air. And when they broke their legs, not only did it cause, I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine a sledgehammer to your legs and having them broken? And the blood that would incur, but, but worse than that, you would, you would die of asphyxiation. You would, you would breathe your last. And the text says, So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who had been crucified with him. I just want, want you to pause for a second. The one that was crucified two weeks ago, we talked about the man who repented on the cross. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, this day will you be with me in paradise? Think about it. When they broke his legs and he gasped for air and he took his last breath, as horrible as that was, that entered him into an amazing eternity, which is all good. It, it truly is. There's no more death or mourning or crying or pain for that man that repented. Verse uh, 34 says, uh, and, and verse 33, let me back up to 33. But they came to Jesus and saw that his legs, uh, and saw that he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once came out blood and water. What, what this is, is when you, when you stick someone like this, doctors have said, I was talking to one of our, our uh, 
residents that's studying to be a doctor that it is the lymphatic fluid that is contained in the pericardium, and when you pierce it, what, that's exactly what happens. In other words, when you do that, you're dead. And by the way, these soldiers, they lived in this stuff. They knew when someone was dead. It goes on to say in verse 36, For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled, that not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another Scripture that says, they will look on him of whom they have pierced. All of the things that Jesus went through fulfilled Scripture. Isaiah, or Zechariah 12, Psalm 34, Isaiah 53. And that is why when we come to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus did die, he was buried, and as we're going to see next week, he was gloriously raised from the dead. Why do I make a big deal about that? And why, why do we need to make a big deal about that? Interesting that 550 years after Luke wrote these words, Mohammed in the Quran would deny that Jesus had been crucified, died, and buried. In, in Surah 4, 157 and 158, Muhammad writes, The Jew says, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it was made to appear so to them, and they did not kill him for certain. So, not only Islam, but there are many groups who deny what Christ has done. Here, G when, when Paul wrote this, he, if you recall back in the beginning, he did eyewitness accounts. So he went to people as a reporter and he got, if you would, eyewitness of accounts of the death, life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ. Muhammad comes along 550 years later and says, no, that's not true. And, and I say that to say, it, it's okay to take a stand for what is right. I'm sorry. Jesus did die according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose from the dead. And we, and, we, and we draw the line and say, that is true. We, we understand that to be true. And now, here's the crazy thing. <laughs> if I said what I just said, because I know some of you got nervous when I start, when I, oh, what are you doing talking about that stuff? Because you know what happens. If I was in another country, there's a real good chance that if I said that, I would be A, imprisoned, and a good chance I'd have my head chopped off. That is the reality of what goes on in this world. And yet we enjoy freedoms here in this land that men and women have served that we could be free and, and, and worship. But just know, when, when you make a stand for Jesus, you, there's, it's okay to say, listen, Muhammad was wrong. He was wrong. And, and what God's word says and what was prophesied and what, as an eyewitness, Luke went and saw and investigated is true. It is absolutely true. Now let me in, encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, page 1124, and we're going to stand and read this passage. As you're standing, you got to know all four of the gospel writers have this. All four of them have this account in, uh, they, they have the burial of Jesus in their Bible. So please stand if you're able and I am going to read Luke 23, verses 50 to 56. It says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision or action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen shroud, and laid it in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the, on the Sabbath they rested according to to the commandments. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray that you would help us to understand 
all what your word says and that we would make a stand for you, that we would count the costs and if need be, that we would change our lives. And so we just give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to go through this and there are Six things that I want you to see about uh, Joseph of Arimathea. And, and I'm going to go through these rather quickly because they're, most of them are very clearly in the text. In the last couple, we will go to other passages. First thing, Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin. And if, and if you recall, you say, hey, wait a minute. Aren't those the bad guys? Well, they're the very ones that took Jesus through the false trial. They're the very ones that uh, falsely accused him. They're the ones that handed him over to Pilate, and, and Joseph is one of 70. Now, it also says in the text that he was a good and righteous man, which we're going to talk about that a little more in a bit, but, but here's the interesting thing. In every system, and that was a bad system, they were not walking in the truth. They were not following what God had intended for his leaders in Israel to be doing. They weren't. They were doing their, their, their own thing, not according to his word. But God had a good and righteous man there. The third thing we see is that Joseph had not sided with the Sanhedrin to kill him. He had, it says that in verse 51. He had not consented to their decision and action. Now, he, we're going to see he wasn't vocal about it. He just either didn't show up, but he wasn't with them. He wasn't one of those people that was saying, that Jesus should be killed. The fourth thing we see is that Joseph had been waiting for the kingdom of God. He had been looking for the Messiah. He, he had been waiting. He, he wanted this. The fifth thing that we see, that Joseph was a, was a wealthy man. We see in Matthew 27, uh, 57, that uh, when it was evening, there came a rich man. He's speaking of Joseph of Arimathea. And so he, it's describing him as a man who had money. And many believe that it was his tomb that which uh, they put uh, Jesus' body in. And the sixth thing that, that I want us to see about him is that Joseph was a secret disciple. John 19, 38 says, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. He was, he was a, if you would, secret in the closet believer. No one knew. Matter of fact, in Mark, Mark 15, 43, it says that Joseph took courage, that he was bold, and that he, he boldly went into Pilate. This is a big deal. I want you to know that this man, Joseph, who was a good man, he sat in the shadows for most of his life. He sat in the shadows while Jesus was being nailed in the, to the cross. But there came a point in time where he said, enough is enough, and, and he, he came forward. He didn't want Jesus to be just taken down and thrown into uh, just a common grave. He took a stand. He took a bold stand for Jesus. He goes to Joseph. He, I mean, he goes to Pilate, who, by the way, Pilate had declared, had declared Jesus innocent seven times. But he had to hand him over. Why? Because he feared the Jews. He was fearful of what was going on. And so, we see that this is this man, Joseph. Here's the guy who, who God used in a mighty way. Now, I also want us to see six facts about the burial of Jesus. Then I'm going to tie this all together. First of all, Jesus, or Joseph is going to bury a dead body. And I bring that up again because there are those who have denied the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and they just say, well, Jesus didn't really die. They would hold to, like, the swoon theory, which says, well, he was in a coma, and they just took him down, and uh, they, they wrapped him up, and when he was in the tomb, and they had anointed him, uh, all of the fragrances and all that stuff revived him, and, and it, that he was okay. Can I just say to you, that's, that's not what happened. These soldiers knew when a person was dead. 
They, that was their job. I mean, it's not my job, but I go to the hospital a lot. I have been with, with some of you when your loved ones have passed. And um, you know what? I'm not an expert, but you pretty much can tell. And after a few minutes, I think you can definitely tell. And so um, Jesus is dead, and Joseph is going to bury a dead body. Second thing, Joseph took Jesus' body down, which I never thought about that till this week. I never thought about that till this week. Could you imagine going to your Messiah, the one whom you love, and having to take the nails out, how, how, however he did that? How gruesome would that have been? But he went, and by the way, he did it publicly. And Luke, who got eyewitness accounts, no doubt got this information that this had happened. He got, he got this, he was an eyewitness. He had eyewitness accounts that Joseph, he was the one that took him down. The third thing, Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped Jesus' body. You say, Nicodemus, I know that name. Well, you do from John chapter 3. He was another teacher who had come to Jesus secretly. Matter of fact, in uh, John 19, 39, it says, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, bringing a mixture of, of myrrh and aloes, about 50 or 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen cloths with spices, and buried it uh, in, as the custom of the Jews. And in verse 56 and 57 of, of Luke 23, the women also of Galilee came and they spread spices and, and ointments on Jesus. And so they prepared his body. Uh, some have asked me, I get this question every now, now and then, they wrapped him in, in a shroud. Is the shroud of Turin uh, that you hear about, is it real? And is it, is it a real thing? I, everything I've read and the evidence is that it's a fraud. Um, and I think, I think that's a good thing that, to under, understand that. How many pieces of the cross that Jesus was crucified on can you buy probably in Jerusalem or go online? The actual piece of Jesus' cross. It's if, if you had something like that, what ends up happening is people take those things and they worship the thing instead of the Savior. So I, I don't think that that is a real thing. Uh, the fourth thing we see, Joseph and Nicodemus laid Jesus' body in a new tomb. Uh, in John 19, 41, it says, Now in the place where they had crucified him was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb that no one had yet been laid and those are just little details, but why is that important? Because in Isaiah 53 that says he was assigned, he was made a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence and nor, nor deceit in his mouth. The fifth thing we see is that Joseph and Nicodemus rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb. And, and we see that in um, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 60. That's exactly what they did. And then the, the sixth thing that we see is that the tomb is sealed and it is put under guard. The, um, in, in Matthew 27, it's a day of preparation. The Pharisees go and they, they, they say, hey, he said they're going to take the body away. He's going to raise in three days. And so Pilate says, go, set a guard over him. And, and so that's exactly what happens. And put a seal on the tomb. Now, all those things are the technical things, if you would, that happened with Jesus' burial. What happened to Joseph and Nicodemus? Because both of those guys went from being in the shadows to making a stand for Jesus Christ. And the answer is, we never hear from them again. They are not in the Bible. You don't hear anything about them. Some say that Nicodemus was martyred in the first century. But if you think about it, if there's 70 of us and here we come walking in the room and you were the ones that put Jesus on the cross and let's say I'm Joseph and me and Nicodemus walk in, we're not going to be welcomed. You're going to say, get out of here. You're a traitor. And so they made this stand and it changed their life. For the last several weeks, we have been talking about what Christ has done. 
And we're at the place where, here's what, here's what I want to make clear. I don't want to be like the timeshare salesman who makes coming to Jesus sound so attractive, so easy, that you don't count the costs. I want you to count the cost. Heaven is a free gift. This church, no denomination gets anyone into heaven, but Jesus Christ bore the very wrath of God for every stinking thing that you and I have ever done. Every one of us here deserves hell. You're not good, neither am I, and I'm worse than you. That's the reality. But the reality is, is that Christ did die for our sins. But the danger that I want you to understand is you can't come to say, yeah, I want Jesus, but I'm going to keep living the way I want to live. When you understand the gospel, when you understand what he has done, when you understand the sacrifice that he made for you, then, then not only do we need to acknowledge him, we need to count the costs. We need to count the costs of what that means. Jesus said, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever dies, denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father. See, heaven is an absolutely free gift, but it is extremely costly because it's a total surrender. And what, what I fear as a pastor, that I, will, that I on Judgment Day will stand before the Lord, because I'm going to have to give an account for your souls, of which Pastor Jason and I take that very seriously. And what I don't want is to sit there and say, well, you weren't clear. You weren't clear with the people. So, so let me be clear. Talk is cheap. You can say, yes, I love Jesus, but if we live in such a way that we deny him, then we don't get it. We just flat don't get it. And I understand the struggle. Give me the struggle. Don't say, none of us are perfect here. I'm not expecting you to be perfect but I am expecting us to grow and, and to be allowing the Holy Spirit come into us as, as we have trusted him and begin to change us. And, and that we would be a people who repent, that we would be the people who, who count the cost, even though it will be hard to do. And by the way, here in America, newsflash people, it is getting harder and harder to, to make a stand for Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't know if you realize this, um, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father except through me, and neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. In other words, the gospel is very exclusive. We, we do believe that, that the way to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not by our works, not by a church, not by, not, I mean, it's by him alone. And I've had people, I've shared this message with hundreds of people, and they'll say, you mean to tell me that there's only one way to heaven? You mean to tell me there's only one way to heaven? How narrow-minded are you? Which, you know what that does? I mean, you start to shrink back, but we can't shrink back because here's what God's word said. I didn't say it, first of all. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so he is exclusive, and we do need to humbly make that stand. We should never be offensive in any way, but we as believers have to speak the truth in love. And I know, man, I know what's going on in the world because um, we live in a world that is getting more and more hostile to Christianity. Do you realize that, people? Um, and I know we're, we're kind of worried what's going to happen, but here's what God's Word says. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I don't say that like, hey, run out and be persecuted. But the reality of making a stand for Jesus, that's going to happen. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. There is a, a new tolerance that's in, in the world. Do you realize that? Um, it used to be that tolerance was defined, was, was to mean that we respected other people's beliefs and practices set forth, but didn't necessarily agree with them. We respect this. Like, they got their opinion. But, but things have changed. Now, the new tolerance goes beyond respecting a person's right, and it demands praise and endorsement of a person's life, beliefs, and even lifestyle. 
And if you don't, then you're going to be bullied. You know, and you're going to be considered judgmental, narrow-minded. Let, let me just bring home a, 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 a real life what's going on here in America. I don't know if you realize this, but a couple, three weeks ago, a judge in Michigan said that um, even though the people voted to keep, to call marriage marriage, this guy threw that out, and so now there's going to be gay marriage. And sooner or later, it's going to be all over America. That's going to happen. How do we respond as believers? Well, to be quite simple, when, when, you, when you make a stand for the gospel, you make a stand for who Christ is, we, we gently, humbly speak the truth of what God has said. But just know, um, it's not going to be easy to know that people are going to look at us and, and there is going to be, how could you be so hateful? How could you be so narrow-minded? When you call sin, sin, whether it is gossip or worry, gossip and worry, sin people. So just so we got those categories. Premarital sex, sin. So it's not like we're coming out and saying, oh, well, this one's bad. No, sin is sin against an infinitely holy God. And can I just tell you, Jesus is not showing up in 2014, and coming into America and going, wow, I guess I've been out of step with what's, what should be happening. That's not happening, people. He is the infinitely holy God of the universe. And though this, this culture is changing, um, he is not. And what he calls sin, he calls sin. And, and what, I'm, I, what I'm begging for you as people of Cross Point, don't fall into what the world's saying, saying, well, you know, the world says and the world feels, listen, I, I, don't be a jerk. Don't be mean about it. But just know what God has said, God has said. And we don't, we say it respectfully. We say it kindly. But we do not back down from the biblical standard. I, I have said before, I say it again. I'm turning 52 this year. I will be thrown in jail before I'm done with ministry for hate speech because I won't do a wedding. I, I know that's going to happen. It just things have, are changing so quickly in this country. And, and what, what scares me is some of you have, you have bought into the wave of the culture. And you're, you're just saying, well, you know, the world's changed. Can I just say, God hasn't. And I'm begging you to make a stand, to, to count the cost. You want to be a follower of Jesus? Yeah. Is it going to be difficult? Correct. Are you going to be hated? They hated Jesus. They're going to hate you. Newsflash. I like to be liked. And anyone here like to be hated? If, if you do, you're sick. I'm just telling you. you know, none of us like to be hated. I like to be liked. But we are not called to be liked. We are called to be people who humbly stand for the truth. Here's what God's word says. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange will happen to you. So all the stuff that's, that is happening and will happen, don't sit there and like, oh, oh, oh. Listen, believers have been going through this for centuries. They have. But rejoice. And as much as you share in Christ's suffering, suffering that you also rejoice. Be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. May I plead with you to know, listen, the world, and, and again, don't be an idiot. Speak the truth in love, but understand you're going to have to make a stand for truth. And just like, just like Joseph of Arimathea came out of the shadows and he said, I'm going to make a stand. I, I am now no longer a secret follower of Jesus. I'm begging you that you and I would be real believers and we would do it in a spirit of love and in gentleness that we would live out his word. And, but just know, it, it's a good thing when, when people say, isn't it horrible that's happening? When you're on vacation, you have a lot of time to reflect. Sitting on the beach, um, by the way, I did put 30 on my head. Still got 10, that's good. Um, you, you got a lot of time just to sit there and reflect. We didn't do nothing but sit on the beach. And when, when you reflect, you look at, you think about things. 
And you know what? This world is a changing. And it's changing quick. And it's all good. Because God's word does not return void. He will work. Some of you, here's the reality. Some of you will leave. Because you're like, oh, you're, you're going to just bug out. Because you're going to want to be with the crowd. And I would just say, don't do that. But it's your choice. But be, be people who stand for King Jesus. You will not regret it. And you will have the joy unspeakable because you have lived for his glory. And this life that we have will soon be over. So my, my plea for you, be a follower of the king. Don't, don't fret about what's going on. Don't worry. Pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our president. Pray for what's going on. But trust a sovereign God that's got your life. And, and don't be afraid to stand for him. Don't be mean about it. Speak the truth in love. And God will use you to make a difference in, in someone's life. Just think about it. Joseph of Arimathea was one of 70. and was nobody. And now, and now he made a stand for Jesus and it impacted eternity in one sense. May God do that in our lives. Let's stand. Father, I pray that right now, Lord, you know, you know everyone's heart. You know what we're thinking. You know those of us that have one foot in the world and one foot with you. But I pray that you would do a work, that you would change us, that we would be all in for you. We'd quit making excuses that we would surrender all, knowing that we're not going to be perfect, knowing that we will struggle on in life, but we will struggle with you, living for you and running our thoughts and our feelings through the, the grid and the filter of your word. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. I pray for the person who might be visiting, and this is the first time they're hearing about Jesus, that you would draw them, that you would open their eyes. Lord, that we would take a stand on, on, on you, all for your glory. And so, Lord, do your work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.